I've watched him quite a few times. He is a really exciting player. He's got some great skills, fantastic pace as well. So, you know, as every chance, he will be a great success. But a lot of the time, he can get a game for someone even younger than himself, Jaden Sancho, that's come over from Manchester City to play for Dortmund. So Chelsea have watched him for a long time, and they must have great belief in him if you're going to spend that sort of money. But, yeah, you're looking at likes of William, maybe 30 now. I don't know how much longer he's going to last at the very, very top level, although he's having a good season again. Chelsea, the one thing I would say, they could probably do with him right this second. Because if you look at the Chelsea team tonight, it's good, it's okay. But with Pedro injured, with Giroud injured, there's not much in that bench that they can bring on that's going to change the game. Yeah, there really is nothing attacking-wise that you would uh, really feel can turn things around. You know, Loftus-Cheek can obviously have an impact on a game, Fabregas, but from a far deeper position. But uh, if uh, Morata goes down early in this game, you do wonder what will happen. Hazard could go in there. The question is, it's obviously an investment in the future, Pat, but you've touched upon it there. Are they already spending the Eden Hazard transfer fee? Well, that's a possibility. I mean, I, I can hope not. I think most people who watch a lot of Premier League football would like to see him you know, playing every week because he's a good player. He's, he's better than that. He's a fantastic player. He, Chelsea have been incredibly reliant on him this season, uh, not just for his goals, but for his assists as well. And they've got him, he's got them out of a hole so many times. But you, know, you have a look at it now and you think, sorry, this still isn't his team yet. This still isn't his squad yet. He's got a lot that he would like to add to it. And he definitely needs somebody who's, you know, a striker. I thought he would maybe go for uh, another striker during the transfer window. Now, that's not beyond the bounds of possibility that that might happen yet. Um, but maybe a surprise to a few people that, but they wanted to get him tied up. Had he not been tied up by Chelsea, Arsenal were waiting, Liverpool were waiting, and there's an argument that Man City might have been doing the same themselves, although I suspect he looks more like a Liverpool player. When we talk about Manchester United possibly making the top four, it's really Chelsea, I think, that people feel they're the club that they have to chase down. The lead is eight points at the moment. Are Chelsea in a position now, after kind of regressing after that really strong start to the Premier League season, where they are looking over their shoulder now rather than looking above them and seeing who they can take down? I don't think Chelsea have been looking up at any point um, beyond getting into the top four. Um, That's it, full stop. Any more than that would be an incredible bonus, you know, in the first season of Sarri. No, they've always been looking behind them. And you, you feel that Liverpool and, without a shadow of a doubt, Manchester City will be in the top two, um, or at least the top three, along with probably Spurs. So there's only one position left, and that is Arsenal, that's possibly Chelsea, and that's Manchester United as well. Manchester United, just about, as you probably know yourself, to many people's eyes, to be written out of it until Ole Gunnar Solskjaer turned up. So, yes, they are looking behind. It's a great run that Ole's put together. But as everybody knew, he got the job when there was four very winnable games in a row. But I don't think that counts for much. I'm watching the way they play. He's made one hell of a difference, getting the best out of those players. I mean, a lot of them, I think everybody who watches United just now is thinking, they're unrecognisable <laughs> as a team. And certainly players like Pod- Pogba, just let off the leash, you know, do whatever you like, mate. And whatever he likes is pretty good. OK, well, look, you brought us into the Manchester United d- debate. I was there on Sunday and not just what's happening on the field is unrecognisable. The, the club itself, the feel around the club is unrecognisable from what it was when I was last there a couple of months ago. We got a text in earlier, Pat, and it basically just refers to the players' dishonesty and um, accused them of essentially being on strike until Solskjaer has arrived and suddenly they want to play for the club again. It's you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. What have you made of the players and their turnaround when you compare it to the way that they just were so badly underperforming for the previous manager? Now, to be fair, I think uh, your, your texter has got a point, an absolutely strong point. But there is more to it than that. And one of the big things is, you know, if you're a player and you've got a manager who's telling you to do A, B and C, and if you do D, he's going to drop you or he's going to put you on the bench and you know that that D is what you're good at you're in a a really difficult position so you can't do what you think you're best at and you can't express yourself in what you're best at and on top of that you know the confidence begins to go a little bit now I know they're top professional footballers and they're paid huge amounts of money but everybody suffers from confidence problems now and again and if you don't believe the manager believes in your strengths then suddenly you're doing what he wants you to do, and it may not be what you're comfortable with. And I 
definitely, I mean, looking around that team, there's a number you could mention, Martial being a classic, but also Pogba as well. Are they are they kind of cheating the, the previous manager or were they not being able to do and let loose the way that would, you know, most suit them? And certainly both of those look like different players completely. So I think it's a bit of both. I think there's a partial, you should have really put a little bit more effort in. However, now, confidence growing and allowed to do what they think they are good at and that really lifts any player. So they're up against Newcastle this evening at St James's Park, Pat, and, you know, certainly on the evidence of the Cardiff, Huddersfield and Bournemouth games, you expect them to go up there and win. How sustainable is this from what you've seen? Um, I think it's impossible to tell and until they hit some of the big guns, um, until they get, you know, a really tough one. You know, there are a number of teams you play away from home in the Premier League that, you know, ask massive questions of you. And they've not, they've not got any of them in the, top, the first four games they get. I mean, after that, you know, anyone from the, the, the other top five, Fair enough. But any of the tough away games you usually get, you know, the West Ham, Everton's and Wolves and all that sort of stuff, they're all going to be much, much bigger tests. And we shall see. And we all got a soul to get. He's got plenty of pressure, but nowhere near the extreme pressure that a normal Manchester United manager would get coming in. Because it's, you know, it's a short term job at the moment. So, you know, do your best. You know, what we're doing before that? Well, they were languishing and looked nowhere near top four. So the only way for him is up to some degree. And he, he looks around that dressing room and he looks out in that pitch and he thinks, well, they're all doing it for me. So it's, it's kind of not bad, but we still don't know yet. The one thing I would say about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, um, a lot of people hark back to that time at Cardiff um, and saying, well, he's a failure. I just do not even take that into consideration. It was such a tough time. The club was in such a bad position. It was a, such a short period of time he had here. I don't think that takes much, you know, to actually fail there. I think the best could have failed there. Um, what he's done apart from that in his career, uh, both things with the same club, has been very, very good. So give him a wee chance, certainly to the end of the season. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets fourth or fifth. That would be pretty impressive considering where they were going. Do you take this sort of the platitudes, the banal enough comments that he's been putting out into the media and his match day programme and his press conferences, which... Because we know what sort of a character he is from when he was a player, you probably do take on face value. But talking about the fans being the greatest fans in the world and talking about there's a certain way we have to play at Manchester United. Is, is he making a pitch for the job or is he actually saying what he genuinely feels and knows deep down that the only way to make a pitch for this job is to win enough games to possibly get fourth and leave them in a position where they really have to consider him as a major contender? Well, I'd be mad not to try and make some sort of pitch for the job. Um... There's no need to massage the, the Man United fans if you're only going to Solskjaer. Is <laughs> you don't need to do that. They love him anyway for what he did at the club. His attitude at the club was perfect. And it was a great mirror of what the club should be like. Um, one of the difficulties with you know certain players of, of a modern, most modern era, and I mean the very modern era, is you do wonder, are they giving everything for the shirt? Will they work, walk away from it as soon as things aren't going their way? Well, look at what Solskjaer was like as a player. He was stuck in the bench and he was a top quality striker, but he still got on with it, still did the right thing. Did you ever see him really complaining about it? He might have been fuming a few times inside. But he was utterly and completely professional. And also, I think somewhere deep inside of him was that feeling of he was delighted to be part of something as huge as Manchester United, even though he was a great player. So, you know, he's, he's saying what he believes, what he feels. And if you listen to certain people within Manchester United that, that were core United people, you know, for, like your gigs and, you know, people like that. He, they feel it. They understand it. They have that kind of purity of what Manchester United was all about and certainly what Sir Alec Ferguson made them about. So, no, he's, he's not, he's not, he's massaging the, the odd uh, ego of the mm. odd fan here and there. But that's fine. That's absolutely okay. He actually feels it too. And he clearly has some sort of a connection with the players, albeit a group of players that he has only got to know in the last two and a half, three weeks. But there was any time there was a substitution made, he wasn't just shaking the hand. He was actually stopping for quite a detailed word with them when Martial had to be taken off after Eric Bailly got himself sent off. He took at least 60 seconds to explain to Martial exactly why he was coming off, probably telling him what he had thought of his performance, whereas we know that just not would have, it wouldn't have happened under Jose Mourinho. The change would have been made and that would have been the end of it. Player takes his place in the dressing room or in the dugout, rather. It's one of my phrases. I hate players saying, I want to be respected. And I always think, just get on with your job, mate. 
However, if they do want to be respected, we'll show them a little bit of respect. And if it, if it works and it gets more out of them, we'll do that. He was just showing them the respect. They were coming off the field and explaining the reasons why. It might well be technical change, resting you for the next game. Lots of different reasons. And if he gives a level of honesty there, players will react to it really well. Uh, it, doesn't, it almost doesn't matter when you're substituted. It's not a pleasant feeling. But if the manager goes and makes a bit of a fuss and, you know, says, like, I'm, I need you for the next game. Well, I need you to be 100%. Or the other guy needs, like, 20 minutes here or there. That's a great thing. That makes you think, well, thanks. You're actually giving us a, a little bit of thought or a little bit of consideration. Because, again, yes, respect is not the word I want. But is there anybody out there doing a job that doesn't like the manager coming up of any level saying, oh, well done. I liked what you've done there. Uh, thanks for that work here. Uh, I expect uh, I'm happy about what you did for us. Everybody gets a little bit of a boost for that, and it costs nothing. Four of those uh, games have kicked off. There's no goals in any of the four uh, four minutes into the first half. Pat, before we let you go, we've got Man City Liverpool live and exclusive and off the ball tomorrow night. Nathan's going to be joined by John Walters at the Etihad Stadium with full and un- uninterrupted commentary. What are your thoughts on this game? It's it feels like a title decider in that a Liverpool victory for many will pretty much see the title decided are Man City going to get this win I want to ask you are they capable we know they are do you think they will Um, it's a really tough one to call if you'd have said it to me even a month ago I'd have said Man City will win this one it'll be okay they'll get back on Um, but just there's so much there's so many wobbles there and Liverpool are playing with such incredible confidence just now and have you look at that goals against column uh, Liverpool as well is so so small Um, something Extraordinary will have to come from Manchester City. I didn't talk about that. Remember the Champions League last season and uh, Liverpool did a did a job on them there. So they're not going there with any inferiority complex at all. This one's impossible to call. Um, the delight is they will go and attack each other and we will have a cracker of a game. I know I probably said that last time they played. Was it 0-0? <laughs> I can't see that happening again. I really hope there's an early goal for somebody. And then it'll just be slugging it out for the rest of the game. And it, it will will be a cracker, even if it isn't a high-scoring game. The tension involved in it. And you're right, Liverpool win this one. I can't see anyone catching them, purely because I've had a look at every single game they've got between now and the end of the season. Can't see them losing any at home at all, because they're just not doing that. And away from home, there's very, very few points that leave, they look as if they're going to lose. They would have to have a complete meltdown. Or if not that, then they'd have to lose Van Dyke to a serious injury. That's about the only two things that can stop them. Your man is rarely short of uh, an ability to articulate a situation, Pat, but can you begin to explain the fall from grace, if you want to describe it as being that, of Manchester City in the last three weeks? From where we were talking about them being one of the best Premier League teams we've ever seen on the back of what they did last season and how they had started the new season to suddenly losing three of the next four Premier League games and having led in two of those. It's it's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. I mean, some of the stats about their possession still looks pretty good. You know, I mean, I was at the, the Chelsea game where it all seemed to start. Um, and for the first 45 minutes, they absolutely battered the living daylights out of Chelsea. Um, but I think it's something deeper than that. Um, I do think people, when you see a team losing one or two games, you start thinking, wow, they're human. So that gives a real burst of confidence to some of the players. But I think it comes down to something much more simple, much more prosaic. Had Mendy been playing, had Fernandinho been playing, had Silva and Kevin De Bruyne been at their very best and fully fit, I suspect they'd just be playing exactly the way we watched them playing for the last season and a bit. And when they get them back, they're going to be a juggernaut that's hard to stop. When they get them back fully fit, I'm not too sure that's the case as of tomorrow. It may be after that. OK, brilliant stuff, Pat. We'll chat soon. Pleasure. See you soon. So Pat and Evan with his thoughts on tonight's games and that tomorrow night, as we said, it is live and exclusive and off the ball. We are on air at seven and Nathan and John Walters will be in the commentary box. Let's hope for the sort of belter we got last season when there were a lot of goals shared between them at Anfield. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and then we are going to bring you some updates from the games that have already kicked off and anything else that's moving in tonight's Premier League games. Off the ball on News Talk. 
Some jobs need a master, a mortgage master, with dedication, focus, and expertise. If you need results, you need someone with decades of know-how, with no distractions, no time-wasting, and no faffing around. Not a jack of all trades, but the master of one. For a job 